We would like to thank our wonderful sponsors of today's program, Lundbeck, Supernus, Kiowa Karen, and Accorda. Their generosity supports these programs and the mission of the Parkinson's Foundation. Hi everyone, and welcome to our newly diagnosed program. My name is Jessica Barch, and I'm the Community Program Manager of the Greater Illinois Chapter. Before we get started today, I wanted just to say a few things. First and foremost, I wanted to thank you for joining us. We understand that this virtual format is a little bit different and it can never really replace that community feel that an in-person program brings. So please know that we miss seeing your faces and we can't wait until we can do it again safely. Until then, we will keep providing this virtual programming for you. In addition to that, I wanted to talk about our wonderful resources. So since this program is really based on the newly diagnosed, I wanna highlight our um, newly diagnosed folder. So this folder is great because it's kind of a, um, a good guide, a good start after a diagnosis of Parkinson's and where do you go from here? So within this folder, are a few items. Um, one is five steps to living, better, to living better with Parkinson's disease. In addition, we have a sheet that just says about Parkinson's disease, which just gives you the overview. And we also have, which I think is so important in here, our key questions to ask your doctor on your doctor's visit. This is something that people really find challenging um, because I think there's so much emotions and um, there's just so many questions. So this lists great questions to ask your doctor. In addition to that, we have a great companion book called Living Your Best Life. This again gives an overview of what Parkinson's is. It talks about tools for coping with that diagnosis and also the importance of exercise. And we have many books. Um, another is Caring and Coping. So this is really for the care partners of people with PD. In addition to this, we have many books that deal with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, which is the movement, and also non-motor. So things like um, you know, depression and cognition. So those are also addressed as well. We also have a very important resource called our Wear and Care Kit. This is a hospitalization kit. And basically what this is, is it has everything you need inside to communicate with your healthcare team about the importance of receiving your medication on time. So um, in this, it also has drugs, listing of drugs that are safe and not safe for people with Parkinson's. So another great resource. In addition to those, we have a wonderful podcast called Substantial Matters. Um, our Parkinson.org website has so much information and so um, many ways to explore that website. Um, and last but not least, we have a wonderful helpline. It's 1-800, the number four, PD info, I-N-F-O. And that is staffed by um, PD information specialists. So um, we really urge you to order those wonderful free resources because they're there for you. And it's really important to be educated um, to live your best life with Parkinson's. So without further ado, I will introduce my first speaker. So um, Dr. Wodziak um, was um, born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and he currently is, um, he's a movement disorder specialist, and he currently is based at Rush Copley in Aurora, Illinois. He is also part of the, um, the Rush Movement Disorders uh, section at Rush University. Um, his interests really lie in deep brain stimulation and he um, currently resides in Naperville, Illinois with his family. So without further ado, I would like to present Dr. Matthew Wozniak. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the introduction. Can, can anyone hear me okay? So I'll echo a bit of what was in the intro video and it's always a little strange to be giving lecture to my computer here instead of a room full of people, but I would encourage everyone to really look at the Parkinson's Foundation website because it has a lot of very good information. And I'm glad you highlighted that pack of information of when you're hospitalized because I can tell you that that is a major issue, no matter where you are with medication timing and things to know. So uh, I'll get started again about myself. I'm at Rush Copley, uh, based out in Aurora. I'm part of the Rush Movement Disorders team. It's a very good uh, movement disorder group. I've been in training up in Madison, Wisconsin, and then Minneapolis, and then came back down to the Chicago area. So I am also from the greater Illinois area. 
So I'll go through these slides here and uh, just put some overview up of the things that, the way I've sort of approached this is in a sense, how I would speak with someone if they're coming to see me for the first time for a new diagnosis and things that I think are useful for people to know. So I'm not gonna sit and read all the, the slides here word for word, but basically looking at what are the Parkinson symptoms that we're looking for? What are some treatment options? What are things to think of other than medications? And I think of it in my mind as in many ways, the things that I can see, what people are noticing that bring them into the office and sometimes what the family will see without the patient actually knowing very well. And I had a experience just a few hours, in fact, ago where I was out I was talking with someone and they happened to find out I was a neurologist out in the area out here and I noticed he had oh, just a little bit of a thumb tremor that was going as he was holding onto the mouse. And I had noticed it earlier, but I didn't point it out. And then he commented, oh, well, you're a neurologist. I actually need to see a neurologist. And I said, yeah, I actually did notice the tremor you had and was going to suggest it and I gave him my card and was going through some of his symptoms with him just where I was sitting. So, um, you know, there's lots of things that I look for and uh, we can go to the next slide. Oh, first, I, I always like to start with a bit of history. So you have this name of Parkinson's disease named after James Parkinson, who is a very interesting neurology figure. He's not the person pictured up in the right hand corner that is Charcot from France. So James Parkinson was in London. He was a physician at the time where there was no specialties really. He's a family physician. He wrote this essay, which if you could read some of it has a wonderful description. And he noticed most of these people just walking down the streets in London and a few of them he actually examined on his own. There's no pictures that exist of Parkinson. He was a geologist. He wrote papers about dinosaur bones and things of that nature. He was involved in a plot to assassinate the royal family with a blow dart gun. Um, so he's a really interesting guy. And he calls it the shaking palsy, shaking obviously being tremor and palsy being some slowness or weakness. Uh, Charcot in, in France, who's really the founder of neurology, decided to give it the name of Parkinson's disease after James Parkinson. Though if you look back in literature, some 2000 years ago, there was reports of things that sure did sound a lot like Parkinson's disease. And um, so he certainly wasn't the first to describe it, but as far as mainstream science goes, he gets the credit. Uh, next slide, please. So these would be things that people would notice. And it is universally true that all these, not all these symptoms, but some of these symptoms will be going on likely for many years before anyone comes to see a neurologist. Sleep, what I'm talking about in particular is people can act out their dreams, shouting, kicking, talking. It's uh, hazardous to the bed partner as they can get whacked. And the, the person who's doing it won't, won't know it unless they're sort of being told, hey, you know, what are you doing? And some people think that this REM sleep behavior disturbance goes on 100% of the time to evolve something like a Parkinson's syndrome. Now, I've seen some people who've had it for 30 years or more before they get any symptoms. So I'm not entirely sure that if you have that, it equals Parkinson's, but it certainly is a pretty strong indicator. Tremors, obviously one of the big things people think about with Parkinson's, uh, just a bit about it. There, you can have a tremor from any number of things. The, the tremor that's involved in Parkinson's is a rest tremor. Often it starts in one finger, either a thumb or the index finger, and it's at rest. And usually you get some finger flexion and some wrist movement, wrist pronation type movement that happens. Slowing down, obviously not a specific symptom, but again, the gentleman I was referencing, I was talking to earlier, then gave the comment of, and my hand feels a bit slower. So you know that overall you're, you're not quite as active as you were, you're feeling maybe it's, you know, maybe it's this, maybe it's that, maybe I'm not sleeping well. 
along the same lines, energy level is lower. As people get older, you, you wonder, well, is this just part of aging? I get this question a lot, is that aging, is it Parkinson's? And I sort of answer by saying you really can't separate the two. Um, shoulder issues, not specifically the shoulder as in a joint, but a lot of people will at first feel the stiffness that occurs, especially if it's on their dominant side in their arm, and they'll say, oh, you know, my shoulder is just not right, and you'll go and you'll get some sort of opinion from someone. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Uh, sorry, excuse me, Dr. Wozniak. You're, I think if you could pull your um, microphone back a little bit from your mouth, it's just, I think it's brushing a little bit, a little bit too close. So let's try that. Sorry to interrupt. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. And someone's knocking at my door too. So. <laughs> uh, that's, that does that sound, sound better? Yes, that does sound better. And I'll, I'll just message you if, yes, thank you so much. Sure. Sorry for excessive brushing noises. Um, so anyway, you know, you might notice that either the hip or the shoulder, people have a lot of issues as time goes on. It's, it's almost universal that as people get older, you have some degree of rotator cuff injuries, but a lot of times this will be something that, you know, will be misinterpreted as, as another event and then not recognize that Parkinson's till later. Uh, next slide, please. All right, the REM sleep disorder, I've discuss. These are more things that I ask about. So if someone's in the office with me, these are the questions that I sort of go over. I have this as a mental checklist. Sense of smell. For Parkinson's and other degenerative conditions, people often lose their sense of smell, again, for many years prior. Also not specific, as people get older, these nerves don't work quite as well. But these are all things that are building sort of towards that evidence of a diagnosis, constipation, almost universally, people start getting constipated and notice that that's an issue. Less energy I spoke about, more anxious. It's an interesting phenomenon. And I think it usually becomes, people have more anticipatory anxiety. So, you know, whereas you used to go out to the store, you used to go and do certain things, socialize, become a little bit more anxious about those situations. Part of that I think is you recognize that there's something that's different, there's something that's changed, or there's a bit of tremor. But I think it's a bit more than that. I think it's a cognitive issue as well, where people become a little bit more anxious, a little bit more withdrawn as part of that, where they're isolating a bit more and uh, just not being as active. Next slide, please. Yeah, so what I look for, um, the reality is that most times by the time I actually sit down in the chair across from someone, I have a pretty good idea of what the diagnosis is. And usually that is, although things are altered now as I can't shake hands anymore and I ceremoniously goop them with uh, hand sanitizer. But as you enter the room and you look at someone, if they have reduced spontaneous movement, if they have reduced blink rate, if they have a little bit of tremor, or a little bit hunched over, as I walk across the room and introduce myself to people, then I, I pick up on all of these things. Um, the hands are a pretty big key. If you think about people in normal conversations have a lot of spontaneous hand gesturing and, and things and you, you really don't see that. Sometimes you could see a little bit of tenting in the hand as opposed to this when you have them hold their hands up. But the, the more common things that are, are being looked for on exam that you think of with Parkinson's disease is the speed of movement. Uh, take finger tapping where you're doing something like this, if you can see what I'm doing. You're looking at the amplitude of the movement. Does it slow down? Do you start fusing? Do you keep a normal rhythm? So you do that in all of the limbs, hand opening and closing, tapping, foot tapping. And then someone's walking. Uh, there's several features you could notice. People become a little bit flex forward. Their stride can be a bit shorter. As they turn, they may take more steps than you used to. You may be a little bit more imbalanced. A lot of times, if it's early and someone just has a bit of a tremor, the only thing you'll notice is just a subtle decrease in arm movement. And or if they have a little bit of a tremor, you can see the tremor that comes out just when people walk and it, and it looks a a bit like that as they're walking. So a bit of an explanation of what's going on with Parkinson's. 
Dopamine is one of the major neurotransmitters in the brain. It's certainly not the only one affected in Parkinson's, but it's the major one that's involved in what we recognize as the motor or movement symptoms. And the brain is really fascinating in that it has all these circuits that have multiple connection points and dopamine is involved in them. But it's easy to, to think of the movement you know, the, the tremor, the slowness, but dopamine is involved in, in much more than that. And that's why some of these other symptoms come into play, such as anxiety and apathy and a little, little bit more withdrawn. You have five different dopamine receptors. You have different areas in the brain that has some combination of dopamine receptors. And dopamine's very much involved in reward, um, risk, behavior, memory, um, motivation. So as your, your dopamine levels start going down, which by the time someone has the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, they're already functioning at a, a fairly low level of output of dopamine from the neurons that create it. So it affects all these things and, and uh, it, it's really important to know all the things that dopamine's a part of. And next slide, I think I have a picture there. Yeah, this is obviously a highly medical sketch, but on the left hand side of the screen with the cartoon version is is uh, a nerve ending and then dopamine being put out to go across the side this d1 through d5 are the dopamine receptors and i think this is a nice picture that uh, you can look at in regards to medications so dopamine uh, i'm jumping a little bit ahead here but the levodopa gets converted to dopamine you have something that's COMT with his catecholamethyl transferase. You have a MAO, which is monoamine oxidase. You have ways that dopamine is cleared out of the system and you have drugs that can affect a lot of these points uh, along this uh, schematic here. To the right is a, a 3D atlas that was created um, and the, the couple areas that are Worth noting is um, STN is a subthalamic nucleus. The red nucleus is the red blob there, and between that is the substantia nigra. So it's it's this area deep in the brain where you have all these things that are playing with each other, and they're really just a few millimeters in size, but it'll give you some sense of all the interplay of uh, people's brains and all that's involved in what happens. Uh, next slide, please. So diagnosis, so after I'm done talking with people and asking these questions and looking for different things, um, you know, you go through the exam, you find slowness, you find stiffness, you find some resting tremor. All these things in my mind are building towards a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And there's this question of, you know, how do you know it's Parkinson's? And to me and to most people, I, I think the exam and history by someone who's knowledgeable in this area and, you know, will look at a patient and give them a diagnosis as opposed to doing a test or some other objective measure. Though we do have something that's called a DAT scan, which looks at the dopamine transporter, which was one of the things highlighted on that schematic. And what it is, is it's in many ways like a CAT scan as far as the, uh, the caliber of the, the tube that you lay in, so to speak. But you inject uh, nucleotides, a uh, radio tracer into the bloodstream that gets taken up in the brain in these areas where dopamine gets taken up. And you have to time it right and you have to take pictures sequentially. But if you have something like a central tremor, what it actually is FDA approved for is diagnosing the difference between a central tremor and Parkinson's tremor. So if you have Parkinson's disease or something like Parkinson's disease, you have reduced dopamine uptake. You look at this image, it has reduced uptake that you can have as different colors. If you have a central tremor or something else, it can be normal or it should be normal. The problem is there are some medications that might make it abnormal um, and, and it's never 100 percent but it is an option that's out there I'll, I'll use it if someone is sort of on the borderline if they have a bit of a tremor that's sort of unusual or they don't fit all the features or that they're just someone who's really just wants a, a confirmatory test 
And um, those are the times I look at it. Next slide, please. So then what's next? This is the big thing. I mean, I there's lots of things I do in my job that are not very pleasant to do. One of them is giving someone a, a new diagnosis of Parkinson's, though it's certainly not the worst. And usually what comes up then is, you know, first, you, uh, thankfully, most people I see have noticed symptoms for a few years and are savvy enough to sort of research some of this. And it's not that they're completely blindsided by this idea. It's, it may even be what they've already thought and they just sort of wanted a, an, a further opinion. But I think what happens is a lot of people then jump in their minds to this idea of a person that's severely disabled in a wheelchair with dementia and dependent on care for from everyone and that is certainly not true um, but you know once you get past the point of diagnosis then the question is really okay so this is a diagnosis you, you're you have to accept that then what can I do and I think there is an error sometimes if someone has a diagnosis and it's pretty early and maybe they have a bit of tremor but it's not all that disabling it doesn't mean you need to jump into medications right away I'll get into a little bit more detail with this, but um, people have always been looking for something that slows the disease progression, which I wish I could say confidently we have, though some people think exercise is as close as you get. And I, I would say that as well, that, you know, even if you have very early symptoms, other than taking medications, that exercise is going to be the biggest benefit for you. And I, I tell people I cannot overemphasize the benefits of exercise. I, I like everyone, I get that it's, it's harder to do than, you know, me just telling you to do it. And you get to the long end of a long day, you don't want to go exercise, but it for sure helps when people start doing it, you start a small routine and it helps a lot. I, I can tell you without question, people I see who exercise routinely do much better than people who do not. And it's one of the harder things that I have as a provider is trying to convince people to do it. If you get stuck in a rut of, you know, well, they sort of sit on the couch all day and they watch TV and then they fall asleep and then they're up at night because they're sleeping during the day. And then you're just kind of sitting around, your mood gets worse, you're less active. So you don't have as much strength. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. But I'll go into more detail. So uh, next slide. So medication, this isn't an exhaustive list, but I thought it was worthwhile at least going through these main um, categories. And there's been lots of new medications that have come out within the last three to five years. The general theme is they're in these categories, they're newer versions of it, and then they're a lot more expensive, unfortunately. But Carvedopa, Levodopa to me is still the best medication been around since the late 60s and it's two medications in one pill. The levodopa is a precursor to dopamine so it goes to your brain gets converted to dopamine. Carbidopa prevents the medication from getting broken down outside of the brain, outside of the area it needs to go in the brain and when that happens people can get nauseous to the point where when they used to give this medication without carbidopa you had to give massive amounts because not much would get into where it needs to go. And it also is a potentially an easy fix if people get nauseous, you just need a little bit more of carbidopa. There's many different versions of this now as far as delayed release, controlled release, dual release, this inhaler that has come out. Um, but to me, that's still the main best medication. Amantadine is an interesting medication. It was also been used since before levodopa actually. And was developed and does work for influenza A, it prevents the spread of the flu virus, but it probably also works on dopamine and probably works on a different neurotransmitter in the brain. And people had found that it, it helps people with Parkinson's. I use it usually in regards to patients who have dyskinesias, which is the extra sort of movement that happens. I, um, if you think of Michael J. Fox, so he's kind of an extreme example this sort of extra movement of not being able to, to keep yourself still. Dopamine agonist. Uh, agonist is a group of medication that acts like dopamine. It does not get converted to dopamine, but if you think of that schematic I had, it, it affects those receptors in the brain that, that work with dopamine. 
that this can have side effects of impulse control disorders, amongst other things. A lot of people will use this in early, early onset Parkinson's or younger patients. How you define that is variable, but you know, say under 50 or something, on the idea that it may spare the use of levodopa. I could probably talk for a long time on my thoughts in, on that, but I'll leave it as that that's kind of an idea a lot of people that have. I, I tend not to use it as much. COMT and the MAOB inhibitors, again, going back to when you're producing dopamine, dopamine then gets cleared out of your system in a couple different ways. So if you inhibit those things, it keeps the dopamine around longer. So these are ways to, it's all sort of strategies to increase your dopamine or give you medication that's going to replace what dopamine was doing. Uh, next slide. Ah, poll question. All right, carvedopa, levodopa is best taken with food, without food, or it doesn't matter. I'd be interested to hear what people think. And they're polling me too. I think I know the answer. Ah, okay. So this is interesting and I thought it would be somewhat variable. Well, good for the people who said without food and I'll talk about this in some detail, but it's something I see that is commonly not communicated to people. So the way that levodopa is taken at, when, you, when you take the pill, the first part of your small intestine has a transporter that takes it up. That in getting into the brain, there's protein transporters. So the way this medication gets in is the same way that protein gets in. So if you eat a bunch of protein and take levodopa at the same time, you will not absorb as much levodopa. So at least 30 minutes, an hour before or after you eat is the best way to do it. Some people take it with a bit of food if they get a little bit nauseous. You know, if it's not a big steak or burger or something, probably not a big difference, but the idea of protein at the same time is something that is worth knowing. Most people will take the medication around mealtime. It's easy to remember that way if you're doing it three times a day, but you should be mindful of this protein issue. And uh, oftentimes I'll have people coming and saying they're not sure if the medication is helping. And I say, well, you're taking it with meals. And I said, well, it may not be helping that much because you may not be absorbing a lot if you're having protein with it. Doesn't mean you can't have protein in your diet altogether, but just the timing of it. And then the question is, well, what does levodopa help with? You know, what can I expect, assuming you're starting carvedopa, levodopa? And like a lot of things, I, I think there's importance to know what expectations should be there and what does it help with, what does it not help with? I, I think of uh, dopamine a lot as uh, fuel in the tank, so to speak. So you have someone whose brain isn't producing as much dopamine, they're slower movement-wise, mood-wise. You're giving more dopamine, it's kind of raising that level, should be more active, should move easier, should have a bit more energy, should be a little bit more motivated. Um, what it does not help with are things like balance. And in, in fact, if you stand up, and you feel a little lightheaded, sometimes that's, well, the levodopa can contribute to that. It, it doesn't allow the blood pressure to get up as quickly. So as you stand, the blood pools in your legs, your heart rate can go down a bit, your blood pressure can go down a bit. And as people walk, you know, if, you, if it's a matter of stiffness and slowness and you're walking, then yes, the levodopa should help with that. If you have trouble with balance where you're falling to the sides or freezing, which I didn't mention in this slide where people walk and then they get stuck, it may not, not that it for sure does not, but it may not help much with that. Um, memory and a lot of these so-called non-motor symptoms may not help too much with that. Uh, although it can help sometimes with pain where people have pain as a function of the stiffness that occurs, then the levodopa can be useful for that. But you need to know what, what you're looking for as you start the medication and what it should help with. So then it gets into the issues that might arise. Um, 
as people are on carbidopa levodopa for some time, uh, that time frame is different for people, and uh, the medication dosage plays a role in this. Usually within the first few years, you have what's called a long duration response where you don't necessarily notice the on off symptoms. And what, what is meant by that, on is medication is working. You're moving well, you feel well, you're not stiff, no tremor. Off is when the medication does does not work. And you know, slower, stiffer. Some people can get dystonia where you get either your toes curling up or some stiffness, tremor gets worse. Um, just slowed down. So this is the idea that you'll see in, in a lot of Parkinson's literature of on off. And then fluctuations are when someone's in a scenario where they take their medication, usually will kick in 40 minutes or so. Again, after you've been on it for a few years, 40 minutes or so, and then kicks in, you feel that it's working. It lasts for some hours, then decreases, and then you have the off symptoms and you go up and down this sort of thing throughout the day. Obviously you're trying to achieve with medications, uh, not as much fluctuations as possible, but so-called motor fluctuations is when you're in this on off cycle that can happen. Dyskinesias, I spoke about a little earlier of that excessive movement. Most commonly though, it's not always, but most commonly this is a function of the medication and most often occurs at peak dose. So. 40 minutes an hour after the medication you see people start moving around and um, this is one of the reason people want to delay the use of levodopa that and it is true that the longer you're on carbidopa levodopa and the higher the dose you're on the more likely to, likely it is that you're going to be getting some dyskinesias so i will say that you'd be surprised how often i see people who are <laughs> moving along and I say, do you have any dyskinesias? And they say, no, they don't notice that they're doing it. It's not really all that bothersome to people unless it's fairly extreme and it interferes with things that they're doing. It's much more bothersome to folks who are looking at them, family members and say, Why, don't you feel uncomfortable? And I will say that people almost universally prefer to move more than move less. So sometimes you err on the side of moving a bit more than being stuck and frozen. The blood pressure aspect I commented on, the levodopa can drop your blood pressure. So you have to be mindful of the fact that as you stand, especially if people have trouble with balance and walking, if you stand and you stand too quickly, you can, you can have a potential fall. Um, it doesn't happen to everyone, but it's something to be mindful of. Hallucinations, that's another one that uh, a lot of people think that that's kind of always a part of it, which it isn't. And part of that is this commercial that's out there. Um, where I don't know if it's too often played anymore, where it shows guys seeing a dog or something like that. And it says some very high number of people with Parkinson's have hallucinations. And what do you need to know in those things? They counted anyone who had a delusion or an illusion, including anyone who thought they saw something out of the corner of their eye and, and they turned and looked and no nothing was there. Or they thought maybe someone was in the room and they turned and looked and no one was there. So yes, these things can be a part of any of the medications. Uh, really all of these symptoms are not from carbidopa levodopa, but any of these medications. But I'm using sort of carbidopa levodopa as the main medication and trying to just go through sort of the thought process of what it helps with, what you have to think about, but all these things can occur with any medication that increases dopamine. So then what to expect or what should be done in, in the scenarios that you're getting the best care. Uh, a movement disorder specialist, I'm a movement disorder specialist. I did two years of fellowship after my residency specializing in the area of movement disorders, which is not only Parkinson's, but uh, Parkinson's makes up a good deal of it. If you're someone who sees a general neurologist in the community, it's not to say that they won't know as much, but they have not been, if it's someone who hasn't been trained specifically in movement disorders, it's pretty likely that they're not as up to date on things that someone who did do a fellowship in this would be. So I think it's very important. And one of the harder things for me is when I see 
patients who have been either cared for by their primary care or a community neurologist, and then they come and see me after they've sort of gone through years of unsatisfactory results. And I think to myself, boy, if I could have seen them earlier, they would have had a better quality of life. So I think it's important to find, you know, if you find listing of movement disorder people in the area, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, social work, doing therapy and exercises, part of the routine. Uh, ideally, you would be in a clinic where you can have all of these features, like a multidisciplinary clinic, though that's not as common as it should be, in my opinion, as far as when you go and see your physician. But they'll certainly should be referring you to these providers and physical therapy, uh, working more on building up strength, occupational therapy, thinking about helping you in your daily activities and finding hopefully better ways to achieve that. Speech therapy, people, if you have Parkinson's, your voice can be a bit softer, can be a little harder to understand people. Um, this uh, on your right side is uh, LSVT, Lee Silverman Voice Therapy. This came about with a speech therapist who recognized this uh, symptom in Parkinson's patients and then built a therapy program. Um, I'm oversimplifying these things, of course, but teaching you to project your voice. Um, the big component uh, is the same sort of concept as people get smaller movements. They teach you to make big movements. I kind of laugh because I know the people who've done it because they walk down the hall with this exaggerated arm swing. And uh, you too can be one of those cheering, happy people if you do this therapy. Uh, next slide. Exercise. Yeah, this is always a question that comes up too of, well, if exercise helps, is there anything specific I should be doing? This is something I found really interesting that uh, all these things on my slides are just kind of screen grabs from different websites. So this is from Cleveland Clinic and several years back now, a researcher at Cleveland Clinic, they had a, uh, a long bike race that was a very long distance and, uh, they, and it was out in Iowa. And they would do this, this event and it was a researcher and his wife who had Parkinson's. And when they would be done with this very long journey, she would get off and say, I feel better. And they would see this phenomenon over and over. So they said, well, let's do a study and look into this. And the way they conceived of it was that on a tandem bicycle that, that you were probably being propelled a little faster than you would have on your own. And that this idea of quote, forced exercise, that's what it is with the tandem bike. The person on the front is, is moving it quicker. So you're kind of having to keep up and they calculate your maximum heart rate and you you have to achieve certain parameters and it, and it works and people are better and it's not you're better for five minutes it's people do better to the point where some of the the folks who are looking at this are saying they think it is neuroprotective meaning that it if you do that the disease will not progress i don't know if i go as far as saying that but that's where this idea of cycling comes from and next slide please Rocksteady, this boxing is uh, probably most of you have heard of this. These, it's over the last several years, it's becoming more and more popular. Um, uh, it's always kind of comical to, usually when I present it to other physicians, they all sort of laugh and say, yeah, I, I don't think Parkinson's patients need to be getting punched, but it's not, you know, you're not in combat with one another. Um, it's again, it's working on speed of movement, working on balance. And I think like a lot of these exercise groups, most of it is a benefit as the social aspect of it. You get together with a group of people, you can share stories, you have the social component. They're obviously motivated people that are getting out and doing it. So I think it's usually it's a very good group that people recognize. And unfortunately, like lots of things currently, a lot of them are not in person at the moment. Um, but I don't think there's any particular exercise. I think exercise in general helps. And some of the evidence for that, I'll share a bit of it. Um, a lot of it comes from animal models. So you can give, um, give an animal uh, an injection of something that then makes their brain look like Parkinson's and reduce dopamine. And then you choose some sort of exercise parameter for 
the animals and then looking at their brains afterwards and you find a whole lot of changes that essentially amount to there's substances that that get put out that can help build up new brain break down old brain help with dopamine turnover i also think that dopamine probably is released as you do exercise anyway so it naturally makes you feel better but there's a lot of information out there that that it does actually change the underlying brain for the better. Um, I, I can't go through a talk without talking about deep brain simulation at some point, but there's this idea out there that's being studied now that deep brain simulation, which I guess I should back up a bit. So deep brain simulation is when you put an electrode down into the brain, this picture that you see here is is the same area that I showed you on that 3D model earlier. And it's down in deep part of the brain that's a few millimeters. They make a hole in your skull, you put this device down in, you have a pacemaker type device underneath the skin, it's all under the skin, and it delivers a current to the circuits that I spoke about, and it sort of normalizes their firing patterns. But there's this idea out there that maybe doing this earlier is going to be quote neuroprotective, meaning people won't progress as quickly. And there's really, really interesting studies that are coming out where you can do these models of people's actual brains, do functional imaging of them performing tasks, and then see all the connection that goes from their different areas of the brain. And you can see that doing the stimulation actually improves and sort of gets back to, if you looked at studies of people's brains that don't have Parkinson's, that you can achieve that same sort of a function with doing deep brain stimulation. Uh, this is this is not at all, you know, universally accepted. This is a research kind of a thing, but it's really interesting. Uh, another paper that's talking about this, so BDNF is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And this is again looking at um, uh, some animal studies and, and things like that, that probably the same thing that I mentioned that they would see in animals that you can achieve that with stimulating the brain as well. This is a really interesting thing that just because it's new and people will probably hear about it, I thought it worth talking about. Uh, I'm, I know I am now getting beyond the point of sort of an early newly diagnosed thing, but I think it's useful for everyone to know what's out there. And um, we just, well, well, in February, Rush purchased one of these machines. So we're the only one in the Chicago area now that has it. And what it is, is the same sort of concept of deep brain simulation, which is you're, you're making a hole in the brain. There's, there's no way around that. But it's ultrasound, just like the ultrasound you'd think of for any other diagnostic imaging. And it's this big structure where it's an MRI and an ultrasound thing built together. And you have, I believe, 232 different individual ultrasound probes, so to speak, and then you create this array. And if you hit a very specific area in the brain, each individual thing passing through doesn't cause damage. But if you focus it all in one area, you can make a whole similar concept to what happens with radiation therapy for cancer. And if you get in the right spot, it works. And as opposed to the deep brain stimulation, you don't have anything implanted in your brain, which is good for some people. Um, obviously, if you were to choose having something metal in your body or not, though you can you cannot adjust it, the ultrasound, like you can with the deep brain simulation, and you actually have to shave someone's head completely bald and put this sort of uh, very tight cap upon them. So it's um, it's it's a new thing that's out there, and it's worth knowing about. This is a picture of. Duopa. This is intestinal gel levodopa. I just try and cover some of the basic, uh, you know, talking about some of the basic medications and then moving beyond medications to sort of, you know, these surgeries and other procedures. This is usually reserved for people that have been on levodopa for a long time and you have a lot of these motor fluctuations that I'm talking about. And what it is, is it goes right into that first part of the small intestine that 
levodopa is absorbed in. And these aren't the best pictures, but you essentially convert your daily dosage of levodopa into this gel. You have this gel pack that you have to wear this fanny pack type deal. This tube goes into the body and you can calculate um, you know, the amount that you're given and it slowly goes in. Um, obviously it's a pretty bulky thing and it's something that's implanted into your intestine. So that carries with it some, some challenges and risks, but so you know about that as well. Diet, um, it's an interesting topic. A lot of people will ask, you know, is there a specific diet I should be doing for Parkinson's? And um, I chose this one paper um, where it's kind of taking a step back on the idea of, well, what does Parkinson's come from? And the short answer is we don't know, but what seems to be clear is that we see changes in something that's called alpha-synuclein, which is a normal part of neurons. And what tends to happen, we think, is that there's a change that starts in people's gut and in your intestine, you have a, you have a nervous system that has its own neurons and it connects to the brain via this one long nerve. And it seems that something starts in the gut, makes its way up, spreads its way up through the brainstem. It's clear that this thing can spread on its own. The question of what's, what's the initial uh, start of it is unclear. But there's a lot of interesting research that's out there that literally looks at the content of people's bowels and if they have certain bacteria levels and other things. But, but this was an interesting paper because it talked about the type of diet that you can get, um, you know, the, the Mediterranean diet versus the Western diet. So Mediterranean diet is essentially, you know, more fruits, vegetables, um, not really processed food, olive oil, fish, not really red meat, um, you know. If you picture yourself sitting along the Mediterranean, you're not going to be eating a giant cheeseburger and fries and things like that. But that they actually found that people adhering to this Mediterranean diet change their gut bacteria probably in a beneficial way. Uh, next slide. So yeah, and then there's this idea of low protein. I spoke about it in regards to the absorption of the medication. And um, so they looked at times where people had a very low protein diet and that showed improvement. This is from 1988 on uh, the right hand side, ketogenic diet. So ketones are what your body produces when you don't metabolize glucose. So a ketogenic diet is difficult to achieve, but it, it amounts to a lot of reduced carbohydrates and getting a lot of your calories in different ways like fat. They looked at low fat versus ketogenic diet. Um, they both helped. <laughs> Although ketogenic diet was somewhat better. Um, but yeah, if you look at lots of these different diet things, so I, I don't really tell people, I mean, I, what I kind of tell people is people intuitively have an idea of what sort of a good normal diet is. And if you follow something along those lines, it's probably going to be useful but there's not a lot of evidence to steer people one way or another, though these things are, are good papers. Um, there's papers that say that more dairy you consume, the higher rate of Parkinson's on the idea that maybe more rural areas have more pesticide exposures, so that's not a real strong study. So you can really get into details as, as far as food. So I wouldn't get too caught up on that, but what anyone would consider a normal healthy diet, I'm thinking will, will be useful. And then it's really important to get, build up a, a network around you. Um, you have to have folks in your life that are gonna motivate you, that are going to help. Uh, I think, again, the best thing to do is go and do some exercise. If you can do it in a group, it's better. That way you can keep each other motivated and have a specific schedule and follow it. You could look on the Parkinson's Foundation website. They have a very nice website where you can search your zip code or search areas and they'll populate a list not only of providers, but programs in the area and the exercise classes and things like that. So it's definitely worth looking into. Um, it, it's, it's something that affects everyone. So I very rarely ever see uh, 
you know, someone with Parkinson's that isn't there with a spouse or isn't there with a family member. And honestly, sometimes those relationships can become pretty antagonistic and not all that beneficial. So it's something that you don't need me to tell you, but it's something that affects everyone. It affects everyone in that household. It affects everyone that is around someone. And you have to have motivation from those who are around you and support from those who are around you. Uh, making a plug for movie, moving day, also virtual this year, but moving day is a really nice program through the Parkinson's Foundation where you uh, usually would go out uh, to an area and have a walk. They have, you know, people that are raising money to support Parkinson's and you see big groups of people, they make their t-shirts, they walk with people with Parkinson's and it's really just a positive, wonderful event. And uh, they're, they're pretty common in different areas. So I'm sure you'll, you'd probably have one near you if you look into it. Um, think of new things. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to just kind of fall into this idea of, well, I'm going to take this medication and that should do it. Medication does help, but it will not take you all the way there. I'm fortunate enough to be in an institution that has art therapy, music therapy, a pool, a boxing gym, and uh, caregiver support. So you have all these resources here. But you have to keep yourself busy, both mentally and physically, and find something you like to do. Um, like I said, the worst thing to do is sit around and not be very active. You have to find something that motivates you, stick with it, uh, even if you feel a little silly doing it. Um, you know, all these things that I listed are things that help with Parkinson's. Again, you can, you can take any of these exercise or different therapies, dancing, look at people uh, who do it and do not do it with Parkinson's and the people who do it will, will do better as far as their mood, as far as their movement. And uh, research is, if you're at a larger institution, an academic place, there's always some kind of research going on. And, you know, a lot of people will always be looking at, well, what's, you know, is there a cure? Is there new medications coming? And that can only be done with people who are going to to help with the research. So it's something to think about. It, I think it empowers you a bit to, to feel better, like you're actively pursuing something and you might be part of, you know, really good medication or really good treatment. Um, there's lots of new things out there. There's wristwatches and things that people can wear. There's apps where it can literally track, you know, if you have off symptoms, if you have tremor, you could plug in when you take your medications, it can track how your medication responses. So there's a lot of interesting technology that's out there too. So there's, there's new things coming and there's new things that you can take a part in that maybe you never thought of doing before that, that you would like a lot. Yeah, the Parkinson's Foundation. So I just, again, I, I grabbed a screenshot of this and, um, you know, thank you for involving me in this talk because it's something I show patients all the time. I show them this website, this tab that says in your area, you can search underneath all these headings. There's wonderful topics of understanding Parkinson's, living with Parkinson's. You can click on that and there's different categories and, and good information, you know, a few pages of information within those. So it really answers a lot of the questions that people have. Next slide. Um, yeah, so I, I sort of like to end with a few things. Um, one is the, just the idea of the journey that people take. And I should have spoken about it earlier, but when someone is diagnosed with Parkinson's, there's a lot of anxiety that comes as part of it naturally. And if you talk to other people or you yourself, you'll hear stories of, well, the neurologist came in and said, well, you have Parkinson's and was very matter of fact of that. And, you know, you hear about the art of medicine and delivering this sort of news and you have to do it in a, in a different way. And you have to understand that what people are going through and what they're thinking of. And one of the things I've come to realize over time is that you start to recognize different patterns. And so I sort of, 
I know what a lot of people are going through. Obviously, it's not the same as what you're experiencing as as a person with Parkinson's or a family member. But you hear these same stories, and you know, they're you're a little bit more withdrawn, a little bit slower, not sure what's going on. Maybe there's a tremor, maybe there's some trouble with walking. And I think of you know myself or any any person involved in the medical field as sort of a, a a guide you know everyone has to take their own journey you're not quite sure what's ahead just like if someone took you on a path that you don't know where it's leading just like someone if someone asked me well five years from now what is it going to look like i don't i don't know i can tell you the things you may experience walking this path i can help you along i can give you things that are going to help you but everyone needs to walk their own path on their own and you can have a lot of help and it doesn't mean that you're going to end up falling off a cliff or you're going to not be able to go anywhere but it's it's an idea of you're you're going somewhere and it's it's yours to own and uh i'll share a couple stories um i was fortunate enough to be educated by someone who worked with muhammad ali as their physician and he would tell me some stories and I was thinking about Muhammad Ali just as a person. He's obviously one of the people that has come to recognize as Parkinson's. So most people don't know he has a brother who had Parkinson's and not saying that getting bashed in the head repeatedly helps, but it probably was not related to that. And I thought of him as a person that, you know, here he was, uh, as a young man, as sort of a prime specimen of athletic ability, obviously was a very vocal person. So was at sort of the top, you know, speaking, being out there, being in the public, as, you know, with his body and being in shape. And then you see him at the end and, uh, you know, all those things were, were taken away. So they would say, you know, he was, there's a Muhammad Ali center in Arizona and there was a gym and sometimes Muhammad Ali would be there and he'd sort of, people would come in with Parkinson's and he'd kind of be there and he'd talk with them. But what I thought of is, you know, this, this contra or this spectrum really of on one hand being young and, and very mobile and then at the end being, being very much the opposite. And he said that he, talked with him about it one day because I you know I can't imagine being you know going from one extreme to the other basically and what he said that Muhammad Ali told him was that he was thankful because it taught him humility during his lifetime that he was able to you know experience this and then know and become a humble person and the other story was shared by during one event that Michael J. Fox was speaking at and he said, uh, you know, imagine that you're out at a campfire and everyone has backpacks and you carry on your back all the burdens that you have in life and all the problems. And you can remove that backpack, place it down on the fire or not on, next to the fire. And, um, you know, everyone's there and you can choose to go around and say, OK, I'm done with this. I'm going to pick up your backpack. And what, what would most people do? And the answer was that nearly everyone pick up, picks up their own pack. And it's the idea that, you know, it's everyone has their burdens in life, but it's a part of you. And you have to sort of understand and embrace what your own personal journey is. You wouldn't want to trade, trade it for someone else. You're still the same person that, you know, is, is a father or a mother or you know, cousin and friend and, you know, this, this thing doesn't define who you are. It's something you carry with you that I'm sure you'd rather not, but it's also an important part of your life. And it's something that, that you can get through and that there's a lot of support to help you with. Uh, next slide. Oh, and thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the Parkinson's foundation for inviting me for this. And, um, patients and family I wouldn't wouldn't learn what I did other than speaking with them and uh, that the family of the patients and my own family of course and the people who've taught me along the way so just uh, thank you
Thank you so much, Dr. Bozak. That was that was great and so much insight and wisdom. So we really appreciate your time with this. Um, before we move on to our next presenter, I just wanted to share a message from. I just wanted to share a message from um, someone on my team named Allison Leifer. So we would love to see her message now. Hi, I'm Allison Leifer, and I'm with the Parkinson's Foundation, Greater Illinois Chapter. We proudly serve Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, but our staff can't reach everyone here alone. If you like what you're seeing today, and you'd like to help us reach more people here in the upper Midwest with resources, free education programs, research opportunities, and community connections, I hope you'll consider making a donation or contacting us. We have a number of volunteer and service opportunities. Please contact us at greaterillinois at parkinson.org to help us reach more people in your own community. All of this information, including that contact information, will be shared with you after today's program. Thank you so much and take good care. Well, now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Jill McClure. Jill joined the Parkinson's Foundation Helpline in 2012. Prior to that, she was an information specialist on helpline serving breast cancer and infl inflammatory bowel disease communities. Her background also includes hospital administration and oncology in New York City, and she has a Bachelor's of Science in Health Administration from Ithaca College. Working to ease the weight of living with Parkinson's disease takes on a deeper meaning because Jill's father lived with Parkinson's. When she is not answering helpline phone calls and emails, you can find Jill somewhere outside with her family and a dog or two. Jill, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jessica. Wow, so um, Dr. Woodziak did a fantastic job and um, covered things in such tremendous detail that um, there's, there's not that much left to say. Um, I, I did have just a couple couple slides to um, uh, help us think about a, a few things, but um, one of the common questions, um, I'm going to run through a couple of common questions that we hear on the helpline where I work at the Parkinson's Foundation, is um, what does Parkinson's mean for me and my future? Um, in, in general, you know, your life will change with Parkinson's, but your life is far from over. Um, Parkinson's is generally a slow moving disease. And so there are opportunities to make adjustments and, and choices as time goes by. So um, that's, you know, kind of, kind of, kind of a good thing um, that um, getting into the mindset of, of making little changes and adjustments and having the time to do it. Um, if you're newly diagnosed and beginning to think about Parkinson's, um, it's important to know that really, um, there can be such variety with this disease. Different people have very different experiences. Um, Dr. Woods Yacht spoke about some of the non-motor symptoms, the motor symptoms. What is the most troubling for one person may be quite different than for another. Some people, it might be the mood disturbances, somebody else, it's movement problems. So because it can be so different, um, I think it's really important to make sure that you don't um, uh, take too much of what you might have seen in somebody else's Parkinson's and try to project that on your future because your experience may be quite different. Your, your journey can, can really be different. And um, uh, this is why they say that, um, you know, if you've seen one person with Parkinson's, you've just seen one person with Parkinson's and it's, it's trite, but it's actually really insightful. So your journey is your own. Um, next slide. Uh, so sometimes people talk to us about um, having difficulty di accepting a diagnosis. And, and um, in some cases, it may be really believing that they have Parkinson's. Um, Dr. Woods he did a great job of telling us all the things that he observes when um, he meets somebody in a, in, a, in a consultation. And I think that's really helpful to know that there are so many things that, that a doctor is picking up on. Because with a diagnosis like this that can be shocking for people, it can be really hard to believe that within, in some cases, what is a relatively short visit with a doctor, that they're 
able to tell you something this this big, <laughs> um, but um, seeing somebody who's really who's really great, um, seeing a movement disorder specialist if you can is ideal. If that's not the person that you saw to begin with, um, or if somehow it just didn't really work, consider a second opinion. Sometimes that's part of the journey for some people, so that they can get what they need um, to to have confidence in their um, diagnosis and 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 to build a relationship that's going to work with a doctor to support them over time. Um, I guess the other way of interpreting this is thinking about accepting the diagnosis in terms of integrating it into your life. And that can be something that's not linear. <laughs> you know, it, it can be something that, that you work on over time. And as things change, you may have to sort of uh, modify it again. Um, it, many people will experience shock and denial sometimes that can be natural when you've first been diagnosed with this and and um, people tuning in today you know some of you may have just been diagnosed or, or been been wrestling with this issue for some time but um, it it's it, again it's it's your own journey and and um, you know it's sometimes there are different resources that help different people um, some people will hit the ground running from a diagnosis and go out and educate themselves and, and start collecting resources and really, um, really facing, the, facing forward and, and, um, and em empowering themselves to, to, to live well with this. And other people may be kind of trying to bury this for a while and, and move on with their life and pretend this isn't an issue. And many people are in the middle and people can go back and forth. So... Um, when you're in the educating yourself mode, you know, somebody like Dr. Wozniak is a wonderful resource. Um, there are other great resources out there. And in these days, there are sometimes almost too many resources. So just be a critical consumer of information. Um, take a look at what you're looking at, where it's coming from. Try to stick with reputable resources, um, thinking about information that's, that's based on on really substantive data and check back with your doctor about what you're hearing verify the information um, and um, you know as, as as you're moving along and in, in living with Parkinson's people are going to give you unsolicited advice and and use your same critical um, evaluations with that too um, there will be a lot that comes at you but um, but it's all part of trying to to figure out what this means for you for you now and and i would just wanted to say that i think that everybody who tuned in today is really taking extremely positive steps towards um towards living well with parkinson's um, next slide please um, so one of the one of the issues that we certainly hear about too is people trying to figure out who to share their diagnosis with when to share it um, and and how even um, and um, these are big decisions. It's, it's personal. <laughs> um, you know, sometimes there are issues related to an occupation, a profession, and, um, you know, you, you need to make careful decisions that have your best interests at heart. And, and there are some great resources um, that, can, um, that, that can guide you on those issues. Um, and then there's sharing it within your, your, your personal world. Um, and some people decide to be pretty private with it. it you know, maybe at least initially. Um, on the helpline, we do hear sometimes from maybe a family member who's been asked to keep this a careful secret. And it, when it becomes prolonged, it really can become a burden. And, and um, sometimes not sharing your diagnosis takes on an outsized weight to it. Um, uh, because it, it's a lot to maintain. <laughs> And uh, it can become a source of stress for, for an individual who's trying to protect their privacy with the diagnosis, but also for the, for the other people that you might have asked to, to not disclose this. So it's, you know, I think it's something to, to consider and to evaluate and to reevaluate. Um, another, another thing about um, withholding sharing means that also sometimes you're not getting the support you might get otherwise, but, um, but it's, a, it's a personal decision, you know, it's... Uh, it's your news to share in your way. Um, so uh, 
I also wanted to talk about sometimes people will, sh will, um, will be sharing this with somebody and there might be someday a reaction that isn't kind. And, um, you know, if somebody reacts badly to your diagnosis, if, if, if they're unkind, I think it's important for, for you to know that um, it probably has a lot more to do with them than you. Um, a lot goes into people's reactions and, and people feel strongly and it, it may have nothing to do with you personally. So um, becoming educated about the facts of Parkinson's can help you stay centered and there are a lot of positive sources of support. So um, those are the places to, to turn to. Next slide, please. I was gonna talk about exercise. Dr. Wodziak did such a great job. Um, you know, there's something like over 3,000 published studies um, about, about exercise, and um, there's, there's tons of enthusiasm for it. It absolutely is the answer to what else can I do for myself besides take the medicine and keep seeing my doctor. Exercise is the answer. It's, it's the secret sauce. Um, and it can help with a wide variety of Parkinson's issues. Um, mood disturbances, sleep issues, GI issues, um, and more. So plenty of great reasons, reasons to pursue it. Um, several types were, were mentioned, but you can find Parkinson's specific programs for dance, boxing, yoga, cycling, table tennis, and more. <laughs> Um, there's no shortage of ways to get the benefits of exercise uh, when you have Parkinson's. And there's lots of uh, in-person events, uh, in-person opportunities normally, and online as well. So um, creating a weekly routine is probably um, the best, and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's doing a few different things, but um, it also has to be safe for you. It has to be feasible, affordable, and fun, because it's really hard to keep going with something if it's not fun. So this is why people say the best type of exercise for Parkinson's is the one you will actually do. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, another question I wanted to, to share is um, that, that on the helpline, we certainly hear from, um, from family members and friends who um, want to help their loved one with Parkinson's. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes it's clear that, that this, that, um, that their loved one is experiencing some issues like depression or anxiety or apathy and that they're really beginning to reshape their life. Um, so, you know, how, how to begin, you know, I think obviously, you know, just start by asking, of course, um, make specific suggestions if, if, um, if somebody doesn't have any feedback for you about what you can do to help. But um, especially when somebody has been, been recently diagnosed, allow them space and time um, for, uh, for processing this and figuring out what the diagnosis means to them, means to other people in their lives and, and their relationships, their personal and their, their private and professional life too. Um, also, just listen. Uh, sometimes that means, you know, you really just need to reserve judgment and, and um, not give any, um, not, not give any feedback or, or tell, tell somebody what they should be doing but rather just give them, give them space, listen, let them unload, um, and, um, and wait until somebody asks for your opinion. Sometimes that's, that's, that's the right thing to do as well. Um, as, as a loved one and a family member, it's always a great idea to educate yourself too. Um, and if, if your, um, your, your dear person um, with Parkinson's is having trouble finding, finding educational materials or finding support, that's something you might be able to help with too. So, um, so that can be a good role. And um, stay connected and sometimes just be present. Um, you know, I think those are kind of the, the essential ways to, to help somebody with Parkinson's. Um, all right, so the next, um, I just had a, a few tips to, to share. And um, again, Dr. Wozniak, really fantastic um, presentation included some things like a care team and, and um, you know, kind of define that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a Parkinson specialist, the rehab special, the rehab professionals, probably getting somebody to talk to, somebody who's a psychologist, a, a social worker, another kind of counselor, um, getting them on board with your team and, and kind of really feeling like you have a team 
Um, and then there may be like kind of an extended team too. There might be other people that you kind of recruit to, to, um, to help you uh, live the best quality, best quality of life and, um, and be touchstones for you to turn to as, as issues come up. Um, so the care team and then the support network and your support network may be formal, you know, maybe it's a support group um, or maybe it's something that, that kind of grows more organically out of an exercise class you go to or um, people you connect with in a different way. But, um, you know, thinking about um, at this stage when, when you're newly diagnosed, really thinking about building this team. Um, you know, this is, this is a, a very healthy activity to, um, at this time to think about, um, think about collecting your, your resources. Um, we also say um, that it's a good idea to kind of build a tool chest for a rainy day. So, you know, in case you have downtimes at some point emotionally along your journey with Parkinson's, to collect some tools and things to use in a pinch. So, um, you know, the, this, this could be things you end up using initially or, or maybe through the years, but like a stash of resources. Um, some of these might be healthy habits that you practice very frequently. Um, some of the others may just be things that you, that you kind of, you know, think about as, as helpful go-tos. And maybe you even keep a list of them so that, um, you know, if it's so that you've created a plan for replenishing your spirits um, and 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 uh, helping you helping you get through uh, a tough time if it comes along so that you can access it when you need it because when you need it you're not maybe as um, uh, well positioned to to think well about what what might help so create it in advance maybe even put it down on paper you know is it med meditating journaling, um, listening to favorite podcasts or music, favorite movie, reading uplifting stories, um, surround yourself with beauty, you know, go to the, go to a museum, the, the gardens, or, um, you know, just even a list of, of, of friends that, you know, would be a boost for you to connect with. So those kinds of things can be helpful. Um, uh, I, I put exercise on there again, because we really just can't say that enough, but, uh, you know, make it fun, do it your way and, and create a system so it really happens. Uh, most days of the week. Um, and then um, finally, just cultivate joy. This is something that you um, need to kind of actively pursue um, and, and um, you know, just not, not let it be last on the list. I, I put it last on the list, but I'm hoping it's, it's so that it, it, makes, um, it makes a lasting impression. You know, so, so things that are hobbies or activities, um, that you've always enjoyed, sometimes they might fall away, you know, naturally or because things change in your life. And, um, you know, uh, try not to let deficits develop. Try not to let holes begin to, to, to take shape in, in your life. Um, so if there's something that you're, you're not enjoying anymore or that isn't, isn't working well anymore, make an adaptation to it. Sometimes an occupational therapist can be a great person to help you figure out how to keep making something work. But, um, but think about being adaptive. Think about, um, think about trying to replace, replace something, you know, or, or find the essence of what was great about it and, and see if there's another way to, to capture that. Um, and um, with Parkinson's, there can be a tendency over time, over the years, that, um, that, that life becomes a little bit smaller. And, and connections can become less. So this is why you need to, to, to build these habits of um, cultivating joy, cultivating relationships, cultivating enjoyable things, modifying things that don't work and finding something to replace it if you need to. Um, you know, you, you, didn't, you didn't invite Parkinson's to your life, but you continue to be able to shape your life even when you're living with Parkinson's. So, so keep looking for the joy. Thanks. Jill, thank you so much. Um, we, okay. we love our helpline. Um, all of your information is always so invaluable. So we really, we really appreciate it. Um, and just for the attendees who are on the um, program with us, we're running about 15 minutes behind time. So 
Um, we'll take about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A, um, depending on how many questions we can get through. And, um, and I'm gonna start that now. So we've invited uh, Dr. Wodziak back and we have him and Jill on, and I'm going to ask a few questions that have been asked from our audience. So um, the first one, um, Dr. Wodziak, what makes a person with PD a good candidate for DBS? Good question, and sorry for taking up so much time, and I could take a very long time to answer that question, but... Um, no worries. Uh, the, when I start thinking about it, um, first off, you need to have a good response to levodopa. Second, you have to get to the point in your life where you feel like you're taking too much medication and it isn't working as well as you think it should. Um, I think often people hear that you don't consider doing surgery until you've sort of exhausted the medications, which I could use medications indefinitely and, and there's newer medications out there. So that's the wrong way to think about it. And you want to have a good levodopa response. So I think about if you think of your best state on levodopa, that could sort of be your baseline with the surgery. That's the ideal result. But I mean, there's, to me, there's not a strict cutoff as far as, as how long have you had it, age or things like that. Really, I mean, I, and, I, and I bring it off fairly often uh, when I first start meeting people too. Not that I'm saying, you know, you should do this, but just so people start thinking about it and they start knowing about it because you don't want to wait too long. But yeah, if you're, if you're taking too much medication, if you have these on-off fluctuations that I spoke about, that's the time to start thinking about it. That may change with these studies that come out if putting it in earlier is, is better. Um, but that's, that's when I think about doing it. That's not entirely answering your question of what makes them a good candidate because it's a lot more detailed than that, but uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Jill, um, what is the best way to find um, a Parkinson's doctor for someone? Oh, sure. So, um, yeah, ideally, if you can see somebody who is a neurologist with a special training in movement disorders, that's the best. Um, it sounds a little like shameless self-promotion, but calling the helpline, we can, uh, we can, we can help you find somebody um, in, in many cases. Um, you know, sometimes they're, they're not entirely close by, but, but for um, pr probably many of the people here today, you can find somebody within reasonable driving distance of your home. You can also go to our website and um, search it, um, search for a movement disorder specialist on our website as well, but we're happy to help if you call us. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Dr. Wodziak, are there certain early symptoms that can predict the course of the disease or its severity? Well, uh, not really. Uh, there's, there's broadly two sort of categories of patients, so this is making this a bit more simplistic, but everyone tends to think about tremor, and um, there are younger onset patients with primarily tremor, or, or anyone that primarily has tremor. They tend to probably respond better to medications and not have a decline that's quite as quick as people who don't have any tremor and have a lot of stiffness and slowness and trouble with balance. I think, as I mentioned with the medication, it's because the medication doesn't work quite as well. Um, but it's still, it's so hard to predict because you have all these variables and, you know, what you can do for care for someone, what you can do for yourself that, you know, even if I could sort of make a chart of here's where you are and here's where you'd be five years from now. I, I couldn't do it, but I don't know if I'd want to tell people that either because it's, there's so many things you can do to change that. Um, you know, I, we've been talking about Parkinson's disease. It's probably fair to address this question by saying you have symptoms of Parkinson's and Parkinsonism or atypical Parkinson's. So if you have early onset dementia or hallucinations or these unusual features, then that, uh, that is not as good of a prognosis. So that's somewhat of an answer too. Thank you. Jill, um, what advice do you give for those whose loved one who has Parkinson's is dealing with apathy? How can you motivate someone like that? Or uh, do you have any suggestions? It's kind of a tough one. Yeah, apathy is a really tough one. Um, so, uh, you know, different things will work for different people. Um, I, 
I think it's important for a caregiver to really understand that it's a thing and to not take it personally. Um, and, and so, you know, being compassionate about it, I guess, is where I'm going with that. But, um, you know, sometimes doing something with them, if you're telling them to exercise, why don't you do it with them? You know, do the video, go to the class, take the walk, do it at their pace. But, um, you know, joining them sometimes can, can make it less of an onerous and less of like you, you telling them to do something. Um, bringing in somebody else to help out with it. Sometimes people really rise to the occasion when there's, um, you know, a cheerful physical therapist or, you know, if, if you can afford it, a personal trainer or somebody else to, to get them um, to, to move, to do things. Um, you know, dang, dangling the carrot of, of a, a, a grandchild or a, you know, some, something like that to, um, to, to help bring in uh, somebody else to, to cheer them on might, might help. But, um, but I think apathy is something, and Dr. Wodziak knows far better than I, um, that's a little bit hard to sort of treat it directly, so. Great, thank you. I couldn't yeah. unmute myself. <laughs> That's what I was trying to do at that moment. <laughs> Dr. Wonsiak, um, is there any baseline of active ex exercise that is recommended given it's hard to be motivated? Is a 30 minute walk enough or does it have to be a spin class? I know you addressed this somewhat, but I wanted to maybe elaborate on it a little bit. Yeah, I think any, any exercise helps. And I tell people just start small. I mean, you got to start somewhere. You're not going to do no exercise and then go be this very sort of involved person. Uh, I think the more exercise, the better. But again, I don't think there's any one particular thing you have to do. I think it's more about, uh, you know, realistic expectations and making a, a schedule and saying, all right, at, uh, you know, five o'clock on Thursday, I'm going to do 20 minutes on the bike or something. So sticking with the schedule and just doing something like Jill yeah. said, the best exercise is the one that you, that you do. Right. So great. Thank you, Jill. How can someone help um, be like a care partner or caregiver? However you refer to that term um, from a distance, are there any ways that someone can help from a distance? Maybe it's a child whose parent lives in a different state. What recommendations do you get for that? Sure. Sure. So, um, I think there's actually one group which is called something to the effect of caring from a distance, but you know, you're, you're not alone in this pursuit. It's, it's definitely um, possible. Um, so, you know, staying connected in the ways that are available. Um, if, uh, if, if your, your loved one with, with Parkinson's is, uh, is up to uh, using this kind of technology, that's great. Um, and, you know, you can stay connected face to face in this way and almost kind of like, you know, do things together. Um, but, um, you know, being, um, uh, being involved to the extent that you can in recruiting people to help them, um, you know, trying to, trying to forge a connection with um, the health professionals in their life uh, is important. And, um, you, you know, just be, being present. Um, being remote doesn't mean that you, you can't be well involved. And if you find that it's, it's really difficult to, um, to, to be there and there isn't anybody else there who can, who can fill some of the, the gaps, um, sometimes there are people you can get to fill in, like um, there are these people called aging life care specialists, or, um, uh, and they, um, they used to be called geriatric care managers. So you know if it's within your means and it's the right thing to do, there's somebody like that that you could you could um, hire to be kind of an intermediary and, and a, a person um, that you could go to who kind of represents uh, the, the interests and, and uh, has some great insights about, about helping. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And you know what? I think that's where we're going to end our q and A. I I think that's a good, a good place to, to um, stop right now. So I just really wanted to thank the both of you um, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, we always really appreciate the time of those who serve the community and, um, and we're very grateful for both of you to be here today. So thank you. So I just want to wrap up our program now. Um, you know, I really want to thank you, obviously, both of our speakers, but I want to thank our attendees. Again, this virtual world is a little bit different these days. And um, like I had said earlier, nothing really replaces that in-person feel. Um, 
of this community because this community is a great community. Those people with Parkinson's, um, it, there's just something special about them. So we really do miss seeing all of you in person. So um, we'll be ending this. And I really wanted to say um, thank you again for joining us and also for up-to-date um, information and um, anything Parkinson's, anything related to Parkinson's, please visit our website, parkinson.org. And also again, um, call our wonderful helpline specialists like Jill here at 1-800-4-P-D-I-N-F-O-INFO. And thank you everyone for joining us today and stay healthy and safe. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.